Welcome to Speakeasy Online, uh, and it's March 2021, and this marks a year since we've been on Zoom, which is amazing. Uh, we should have a cake or something, but we haven't. Um, wow, uh, it's been quite a busy year, and we've had a, a lot of uh, a lot of hijinks and a lot of uh, memorable stuff, and it's all on uh, YouTube so, because people have very kindly said we can um, record the events, which is lovely. And uh, okay, without further ado, we'll um, we'll crack on. Um, this is a piece I wrote for the John Hegley Keats workshop we did a couple of weekends ago, which was really great. And uh, John Hegley was really chuffed to bits with everybody who attended and all the work that we shared. And uh, one of Val's rhyming poems, he loved the rhymings on those, Val, and uh, and also the letter that Kelly wrote to uh, to John Keats was very touching as well. The pronunciation of Kakubri that Russ chipped in with was much appreciated as well and um yeah just everybody so everybody who joined in was was really uh well thought of and really appreciated by john hegley so that was that was great uh and this is a piece called awkward bow uh which is based on uh some of uh john keats writing and uh bits and pieces so uh here we go when we are young we think spring will ever last eternal. To relish in the song of birds, to hear the sweet music of the blackbird, nightingale and song thrush. Nature's symphonies are divinely made, if not by divine hands, then by their very nature, all things are divine in their creation. But all too quickly, the sun's warm blanket is stripped away. The inky shroud approaches ever more swiftly our last horizon hurries forth to greet us. We march with our fate, inevitably etched before us in time. And in the everlasting stars, our afterglow has long since passed. Spectral figures await, with thin silver hands outstretched. Faceless faces grimacing, smiles forever etched. As our small stage reaches a concluding crescendo. And now, a final act before we take one last awkward bow. And there you have it. Thank you very much. Next up, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I'll start off with the poem that was selected for for this anthology that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm not sure if I've read it here before, but <clears throat> if I have, I hope you won't mind hearing it again. Floating. While swimming, I noticed a dark speck floating in the pool. A wasp, I thought, probably dead. Not wanting to risk a sting, I cupped my hands below and whooshed water and insect aside. Beached on the tiles, the wasp heaved rhythmically, a shipwrecked sailor flung ashore, gasping, seeping chlorinated water. One umbrella-spoke leg repeatedly tried to unfurl, a limp wing attempted to open, two little movements that sent it spinning a one-oared boat paddling nowhere. Using a leaf as a scoop, I gently placed it on dry tiles, then swam a few more lengths and returned to find it still at last. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll read, uh, I've got a couple more and as usual I'll have to leave at 8.30 so I'll, I'll just read two more if that's okay. Uh, these are quite new ones. Um, sheep philosophy. Walking up the path I saw sheep grazing, some standing, some lying, going about their sheep lives. The ram's horns curled flat against their heads with soft ears poking out through brownish whirls. Some had creamy fleeces, others looked dirty, 
with shaggy brown bits dangling behind. Yet they coexisted easily, peacefully, no apparent conflict, no jealousy. To carnivores, they're just bags of meat on stilt legs covered in useful wool. I caught a ewe's yellow gaze. She stood motionless, staring back at me. What did she see? And what must it be like to lead a blameless life, knowing only milk, grass, sun, rain, birth, death? And um, thank you. Uh, finally, just one last one. Um, this is, it's a, a sort of abstract one, really. Um, loss. Think of a brick dropped onto a glass bowl. Think of the thud and tinkle as the shards skitter outwards. Think of the breast of air once held in the bowl. Think of the areola, the leaf-shaped lobules, the branching milk duct. Think of the way the ducts once filled with milk with a blissful ache. Think of the older sagging breast in profile, a curve without a lover. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Kelly. And you've got to tell us what you're having for dinner, Kelly. Is it soup again? <laughs> no, we, we're just having pizza tonight. We all feel lazy. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, uh, David Bamford. Oh, he says Hello, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, my connection just sort of went uh, oh. kaput, but here I am. Uh, yes, it's me to shoot, is it? Uh, go ahead, yes. Read. Right, okay. Uh, Apologise for my absence. A um, bit of context. Uh, we recently moved house uh, in, um, in the middle of February. Moved into a, it's a, a new and well, it's an old new house, a house that has been refurbished. It's part of the old primary school. And uh, so we we're faced with this pristine dwelling. You can now see it's not quite so pristine because there are pictures on the wall behind me. But when I was faced with all these um, gleaming white walls, I could not bring myself to deflower them by uh, banging nails into them to hang pictures. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever felt yourself in that kind of position, but the, the first nail, the banging in of the first nail uh, is really very alarming. And it was that, uh, the fact that I had to put up a picture, because we've got quite a lot, lot of pictures, that caused me to write this. It's called simply and rather, um, rather pedestrianly, making a hole in a wall. A wall, unsullied, new without a stain, a surface, free of ripple, ruffle, blemish, blank, serene, a picture hook positioned on the unbesmirched expanse of wall. A hammer's head is poised, descend, strikes, embeds the pin into the wall, makes a hole where just before was blank, impassive purity, now forever broken for a picture to be hung. That's all. <laughs> that was great. Uh, yes, I think we, we can all identify with that sort of <laughs> making your first mark on, on, a, on, a, on a, a blank wall like that, yeah. And somehow the second and the third and the fourth and the umpteenth, uh, it, it's not so bad. Once you've done the first one, then the others, uh, the others will follow. Thank you very much. Do you have an, another one, David? Or I do, yes. Do you want it now? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, right, okay. Um, it's still really in the context of our new abode. Um, the second floor is under the roof, so um, the ceilings are all sloping roofs uh, with roof lights in them. 
And in one of the bedrooms, the smallest bedroom, which I call my gym, uh, I have a treadmill and an exercise bike. And one morning, shortly after we'd moved, I was pedaling away on my bike and I caught a movement outside the window. And it was the beginnings of a murmuration of starlings, uh, which is something which absolutely captivates me. Uh, all that flow of movement is quite incredible. Anyway, this one is called Morning Murmuration. In the pre-dawn dark, black shapes of naked trees move gnarled limbs, slowly moving skeletons raised skywards above a black grass slope and gray fringed clouds throng massively in a barely lighter sky. A flurry of shards of jet loops in crazy arabesques as swarms of starlings swirl across the space framed by the roof lights edges in early dawn exuberance. A protean mass of airborne wizardry arcs and swoops and changes shape as a maiden blush of morning sun creeps, peeps shyly from behind a cloud. You've, you captured that imagery brilliant there, David. That Thank you. Really good, really good. That was great. Do you have one more or? or uh, that... I do have one more. Okay, yeah. have you got another one? Uh, okay, right. Uh, this one is, um, this is, it's called 2020, A Second Goodbye. Uh, I wrote one sort of epitaph of 2020 and um, it was maybe a bit gloomy. And this one I wanted to inject an element of hope uh, into this. 2020, a second goodbye. A year that shook us up, a year that locked us down, that distanced us, sanitized our hands incessantly, covered up our mouths and noses, closed our churches, shut our shops and ruined businesses. As we watched infections rise the death toll rise, while with silent admiration, punctuated by applause, we paid tribute to the NHS, whose tireless but weary workers struggled on, keeping us alive. We nursed our mute despair, as around us the virus changed, transmuted, finding deadlier ways to kill. Would it never end, this plague held that held the world to ransom. Pessimism held the world in check. Yet let us not forget, this was the year of Captain Tom, of Marcus Rashford and others like them. Take heart, there's always hope amid the gloom. Well said, David. That's all, folks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Roz, what you got for us? Hi. Um, not a lot, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I, today, because it was so nice, we went round Ennerdale, which was rather lovely, but rather a long way as well. Um, anyway, so I've, I've got this. I was thinking about water. It doesn't actually really go anywhere or say anything but you can have it. Lakes are resting places for water. Nurtured by fresh rain water, lakes are still wells of wisdom that lie in landscapes long devoted to them. Nestled and cradled by hills, glorified by trees, grasses and flowers, they teem with wildlife. They are the heart of their community. To gaze across a lake is to feel contentment. Rivers are, oops, <laughs> rivers are, oops, my computer's gone mad. Uh, rivers are the carriers of water. Rivers are playful, adolescent waters, never still, running all over the place, trying to carve out their niche, changing course, making mistakes. They create riverbanks of beauty, 
and our raging torrents of destruction. Delightful, but dangerous. Gazing at their water, you know it cannot be trusted. Seas are the destination of water. The sea is vast and constantly arrives, crashing like an old friend returning as wave after wave washes up on the shore. You must turn your back to the land to gaze where water and sky meet in the haze of an uncertain horizon filled with endless possibilities. You must have faith to enter the ocean. Rainwater recycles lakes, rivers and seas. And then I was desperately trying to write a last verse earlier, but I think I'll miss on that one. <laughs> and that's me for today. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> got a, a lovely triptych of water related poems there it was great fantastic thank you rose darren hello hello yes it's great to see you all sadly i'm often unable to attend speakeasy because um, i teach a lot of evening classes but fortuitously, this particular month, um, I have no class planned for this evening. So it's great to be here. So thanks very much, Phil, and it's nice to see you all. So I have only one poem um, to read this evening. This is actually a poem that I'd written as part of a, a wonderful event that Barbara Rennell had arranged um, on the theme of Time and Tide, I think it was, uh, perhaps a little over 18 months ago. I can't quite remember exactly when. <clears throat> so. I'd written, and I'm going to read for you now, a villanelle. Now, this is not me trying to be a fancy pants by saying I've written a villanelle, but rather um, I, I can't write free verse, you know? I need to rely on some kind of form or structure to help me through. Um, great, so I'll just go ahead and read it then, okay? So it's called The Winds for Quartets. And actually thanks to Owen, because he helped me think of the title for it. So I appreciate that, Owen. He's not all bad, really. So The Winds for Quartets. Pushed by winds that carry song, arrives the tide. I watch the grey blue hue sheath sand and form a line. For humanity's future, what will we provide? Where once was calm and blue horizons stood earth wide, storm surges, typhoons, floods, and hurricanes combine, thrust by winds with haunting song, arrives the tide. Where once coasts and wetlands gave wildlife homes to hide, lost habitats of plants and fish on which we dined, for humanity's future, what will we provide? Where once stood cathedrals in which we took great pride, humanity, now much maligned, is forced to climb, thrust by winds that have no song, arrives the tide. The two thirds left of land that some have eyes to bribe, as coastal cities swallowed whole become lost shrines. For humanity's future, what will we provide? Time's indifference cannot know of our decline. The world's growth or downfall is of our own design. Pushed by winds which may have song, arrives the tide. For humanity's future, what will we decide? The end. That was really good, Darren. Thank you very much for sharing that. Excellent stuff. And followed on the theme from Roz. So yeah, more water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Becca, hello. How are you doing? Hi. Sorry, I'll just get, normally I do it off my phone, but I realize I can just have it on the screen and then I'm facing the right way and everything. But let me just get the right thing up. Da, 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 da. That one, that one. Right, <clears throat> this evening I have two wonderful poems by a local poet. You might have heard of him. He's called um, uh, Tom, Tim, no, Tony, Tony Hendrick, that's the bunny. Hi, Tony. Right. Sorry, I've made it the wrong size. Let's go for some idle chit chat. 
Has anyone else got loads of sleepy bees in their house lately? <laughs> Our house is overrun with sleepy bees crawling out of the chimney and then batting against the French doors at the back. But it's kind of a minefield. There were four there. Four! I was trying to go at the back door and I had to dance over four bees that blend into the carpet. I did have to dance. Anyway, I killed some time. So, <clears throat> by Tony Hendry. St. Ninian's Well. Briscoe was Burkscuff, clearing in a birch wood. Now, past neat cottages, empty winter fields fall to a fast flowing river. I come upon a holy well named for a Pictish saint, a beguiler lost in myth since the Romans left. The wellhead excites. A Romanesque arch in worn local sandstone over a rough square trough. But my know-all phone lacks all imagination. Early Victorian, it says. Yet there's a holly tree giving evergreen hope. So here stands Ninian starting a mission north by a stream in a clearing. He is curer, purifier, blesser and baptizer on this Candlemas day when water from his cup is cold enough to make babes and old folk gasp. Patiently, I wait in line. But when the phone rings, I must step aside. And now I'm talking with a nurse, setting a time and date to talk through test results. Fate unknown, saint gone. Yet I am not abandoned. I walk on to the river. Thank you. And poem number two, <clears throat> What It Is by Tony Henry. It is what it is, said the stolid man, on seeing what the flood had done. Too dull, I thought, too deadpan. So I tried the devices one by one. It's like the wrath of God, I said, with simple simile as starting trick. I told him to heed a mithering bed stranded in the street. And the lick, knock, slurp, slop, and slap of brown waves as the tide dropped and the vile ooze and smell of crack. Folk crying buckets as they mocked. I tried hyperbole. This was Ararat, I said, and we, left stranded on it, may look a bit like half-drowned rats, but our heroes will never submit. Nothing I tried brought any spark. The stolid man, impervious to fizz, just gave it to me, clear and stark. It is what it is, what it is. Thank you, Becca. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. What a lovely reading. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pretty good writing, too. Thank you. Thank you. Great reading, great poems. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant stuff, both of you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, Owen, have you got have you got something for us? I'll just crack on. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one's called "The One Hundred Four Million Dollar Man," and it's about the artist Alberto Giacometti. Giacometti, I think it's Giacometti. Uh, the One Hundred Four Million Dollar Man. Alberto Giacometti lived in a hovel, stashed his cash in a box beneath the bed, spent most of it on bad wine and brothels, wiped his ass on some of it, so little did he care. Here, use this, 
he would say to a pal about to drop a load, take the town brown, stack logs in the woodshed, or whatever euphemism they used back then. His art was brutal, never beautiful, hovering between being and nothingness, said Jean-Paul Sartre, being Jean-Paul Sartre or not. He took long walks with Samuel Beckett, where they discussed, you guessed it, nothing. Giacometti never stopped working, never knew luxury and never left his hovel. He died in abject poverty, the richest man in the world. That's that one. Sorry, I'm trying to find stuff on my phone here. Let's do that way. Now this one's this one's uh, this one's about, sna about snails and death. It's called <laughs> a small unnoticed thing. Because today at least there are no great immediate griefs to hand, other than those arising from the simple act of living, from breathing the indifferent air. I will contemplate instead the passing of a small unnoticed thing. The death of snails, for instance, which must die quietly in their thousands, since we do not hear their parting gasps, their prayers, their moanings. Only the smashed shell cracked beneath the falling foot, planet-sized and fast as lightning to their small, slow way of being in the world. Or perhaps the thrush knocks knell of their bodies outer beaten, drumsticks struck against a garden rock, the dull bell ring of their unmaking a common enough slaughter. And do they name it fate? If they have sinned, if they believe in sin, I believe vengeance, divine retribution, karma. Do they dream up reasons for the boots all the size of a house, the spear of pain jabbed in the gut, the hammering out of consciousness? Do they read, like, do they read their days like history books, quick flicked in the flying final flash of reckoning? tracing back the path that led to their denouements. Future blind, deaf to all the echoes that utter from before, the snail sees nothing in the runes of scattered stars, just a string of lights to dime bow by, the slow spun wheel of its thousand blessing teeth tearing through the world. O oh life, when it comes, let your leaving be by neither beak nor boot nor bodily devouring, but by the green and sheltered grace of the shaded undergrowth, loam pillowed, gentle entropy a bed to sleep and dream. Let them go the way of the untrod gastropod, belly full, senses dimmed immense as poppy seeds, their small cells melting in the neuron clusters flutter. Life slime spilled from the spiral of their days, softness giving way to softness. That's that one. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Val, have you got something for us? Sorry, yeah. Um, right. My battery's about to run out on my computer, so no. um, I'm just going to read um, the, the one that I read for the kids' workshop, and it's based on Ode to Autumn. It's called Ode to Lockdown. Season of closures and self-isolation, close bosom friend of the COVID app, conspiring my way to a quick vaccination by rewarding the NHS with a clap. I walk past shops with shutters down, the hairdressers with the empty chair, a swell of people brought out by the sun, wandering about but going nowhere, while in the dying remains of the town, figures in masks walk sadly around hoping for a summer brimmed full of fun. And that's that. <laughs> the battery's going to go on any second now, so... Well, that was that was really good, Val. Thank you very much for sharing that. It was well next time. really lovely. Take care. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Okay, uh, Craig, what have you got for us? I would. Have we got plenty of time left? We've, yes, yes. Are we okay? So I can I can ring my uh, read my long one first. Then. Go for okay. it. Okay. This is called Jack and Marguerite. 
He sidles through the gap in the privet hedge, tiptoes to where the spring bulbs will be bursting into life in the weeks and months to come. He skirts the lawn via a sloping sandstone path that matches his cap and echoes the shades of his neat new casual clothes in a barely hopeful bid to draw less attention to himself. Slowly and stealthily, he snakes his way around the sprawling single-story building until he reaches the dining room side window. She has been waiting. His presence flicks a switch, turns on her radiant smile and briefly ignites her steel blue eyes. He presses his palm against the icy pane. She slowly reaches hers out towards it, and they are back together again, strolling arm in arm down the Champs-Élysées. Jack and Marguerite lived on the same street. Her name was Joan. Margaret was her middle name, but she wore a berry and liked a sherry or three. She taught him French and read Paris Match, so Jack thought it fitting. Marguerite. Tall and awkwardly handsome, Jack was a quiet ex-military man. He'd been a cook in the army and made a mean mutton stew. She thought he'd be a good catch for some old spinster one day, when together once alone they were sitting. She'd poured him a glass, oh, long after her husband had passed, and they'd sit and sip and sit and sip and sit and watch the flowers grow and grow and grow and grow until finally the question he asked. She politely said, no, thank you, but do move in with me, please. To tend to your flowers and bees? Yes, and more, but be gentle, mon brave, and don't waste time. We've done quite enough of that already. Too sweet, he chimed, as he rose from his knee, unsure of whether the battle was won or lost, and his legs just a little unsteady. He would become her rock, her solace, a quiet but picturesque harbour in which to shelter and find some amusement whenever the storm clouds would gather above. She was his pearl, his summertime daisy when winter set hard. She was his one true love. Oh, she knew he knew he loved her more, but she would try, and she did, frequently. He mouths, hello. He mouths, I love you. Nothing. He mouths, I love you. And makes hand gestures, and still there is nothing. But then, zut alors et sacré bleu, she raises a bent index finger and slowly traces around the hand, leaving faint trails of garlic mayo that mix with the condensation. A new twist to the ritual. He beams an unspoken conversation. Peter works as a porter in the kitchen. A sometime handyman, he doubles as security when the occasional need arises. Come on, Jack, I'll walk you back through the tradesman's entrance. Matron's been at me again. Says it's unsettling the other residents and you need to stop. No visitors during lockdown, remember? Maybe cut it down to once a week, although she's off tomorrow, but I never told you that. Tomorrow came, but Marguerite didn't. It had happened only twice before. They said she'd had a bad night, Jack. Still not feeling too good this morning, but she's asleep now. That's it. That's all. Go home now, please. They promised to keep you posted. Try tomorrow, but watch out, matrons about, and don't say I didn't warn you. Next day, a huge bunch of flowers squeezed through a gap, with not-so-nimble Jack in tow. He tiptoed through the snowdrops, so soon they'd bloomed, before checking and adjusting himself. He inhaled deeply and paced across the lawn in full military uniform, origin unknown, taking the most direct route to the dining room now. Slowly and solemnly, he's put his palm to the glass and waited, and waited, and waited, then, from out of nowhere, 
a hand and reached out and patted his back ever so gently. Hello, Jack. Would you mind coming round to reception? I'll bring you out a chair and make us a nice cuppa. Matron wants a word. Oh, what's that? I said Matron wants a word. She's been trying to ring you. That's that one, thank you. Very, very want... powerful, that one, Craig. It was really, really good. Do you want the next one? Please do, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote this uh, last summer. It should really be written by two people, but I'll try and... Uh... I'll try and do both together. It's called Lottery. Piles of small change, 5p. A rusty tin, 5p. A small boy's backpack, 5p. To put them in, 5p. A short cycle ride, 5p. Into town, 5p. Finds a willing stranger, 1p. To put them down, 1p. On the counter, 1p. Two lucky dips, 1p. For the boy aged six, 1p. Nearly seven. 20p cheers mara 20p he heads for home 20p streets narrow 20p close terraced homes 20p mother still sleeping off 20p the heavy night before 20p she takes things coughs 20p as he slips in alongside her 20p then stirs head banging 20p from full stirring cider 20p on the table beside her 20p the little round pills 10p loving cuddles cushion 10p violent noises 10p sweary voices kicking doors 10p in next door houses 10p piggy in the middle 10p with cotton wool ears 10p pigsty living room says 10p the last two years 2p gonna find a way out 2p need a lottery win 2p lifestyle tonic and gin 2p but never buys a ticket 50p, here's a chance excitement. 50p, got one with the first four numbers. £4.63 in total, wakes mum from her slumbers. Enough for two, a fifth one needed to make her happy. That's it, thank you. Excellent stuff. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of the the, the first half. Um, I forget, we've had a few other people join us since we started off. Uh, uh, Drew, did you want to read anything? Or are you just listening? Just listening. Okay. And uh, Josephine, um, I think you'd maybe like to read something in the. Would you like to read in the second half? Is that okay? Um, yeah. Um, we'll maybe put Josephine in after after Ross is that okay and then George you can follow Josephine is that okay yes absolutely okay cool 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 cool, cool. all right this is this is where in in the old days we would have a break do you remember <laughs> do you remember when we could meet in real real life no you don't remember that Darren <laughs> it was so long ago I've forgotten the sensation yeah. of it but I've been told it's quite a pleasant experience. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully it won't be. Well, who knows? Too long before we can we can do it again in real life. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, it'll be really really strange meeting up again. Not because the people are strange, just because the sensation. Because we've not done it for so long. I'm going to sort of backtrack from this. I'd worry if it wasn't strange. It's never been a normal event. And that's what's good about it. <laughs> that's why it's wonderful. That's a ringing endorsement there. Cool. I I have to sneak off now, but lovely to see you all. And I'll, I'll watch the second half on YouTube. Okay. See you soon. Enjoy, Enjoy your, your pizza soup. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, Kelly. Bye. Okay. Do you fancy a, a little story? I know we just had a little story, but I, I've got a story as well. Does that sound okay? All right, okay. Uh, for those of you who've not um, been to one of these uh, online before, you're probably going to be very confused. But this is uh, episode six of the continuing 
adventures of uh, our favorite uh, vigilante uh, hero, Kung Fu Penguin. Thank you, Becca. That was the, the wah, 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 Kung Fu uh, stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Um, just give me a second. Episode 6 of Kung Fu Penguin. Last time, Kung Fu Penguin and Detective Snow Leopard were following up a lead on a drug smuggling ring with ties to the Purple Gerbil Nightclub and its laid-back manager. They headed to the docks, only to be ambushed by two sinister characters, Razor Bill and the so-called Asthmatic Assassin. Our heroes were knocked unconscious and sealed inside a packing crate. I awoke to discover I was inside some kind of wooden box. I was surrounded by straw. Detective Snow Leopard was beside me. Through the tiny gaps between the wooden planks, I saw light and dark shadows go sweeping past. The box was being wheeled down a long, dimly lit, reinforced concrete corridor. After a few minutes, the momentum slowed. The squeaky wheels came to a halt, and the accompanying footsteps disappeared back the way they had come. Things seemed pretty dark. I could hear a distant drip of water dropping from a pipe somewhere nearby. You wait, Penguin? Yeah, Detective, I'm awake. The cup pushed against the wood. It, did, it didn't It did budge. Stuck inside a crate. The lid is nailed shut. Hmm, that's not a problem. It takes a lot of training to go into deep meditation. Not a lot of people know how to summon the energy from your chakras. But luckily I do. I find myself with a lot of time on my hands and learned how from a book. You got to quieten your mind, focus, control your breathing, align all your energy and you can do incredible things. With a powerful punch through the wood, Kung Fu Penguin quickly burst out of the wooden crate. He removed the few loose bits of straw as the detective tore the splintered wooden panel away and escaped the confines of the packing crate. We found ourselves in some kind of bunker. It was dark. An enormous glass wall ran all along one side for about 50 meters in length and 10 meters in height. Clear blue water appeared to go on almost endlessly. Rocky outcrops seemed to rise up from the golden sands. A few tropical fish suddenly flew by. A starfish drifted between waving fronds of grass and seaweed. The brightly colored corals and plants giving home to various sea anemones. Speaking of seeing enemies, Kung Fu Penguin recognized a couple of figures in the darkness. Thank you, thank you. There's more like that. <clears throat> Sit down, you ain't going nowhere, snapped Razor Bill, a gun trained on them both. Yeah, the big boss wants to talk to you, grumbled his associate. Kung Fu Penguin and Detective Snow Leopard each sat in a black leather effect chair. A menacing figure approached, brandishing a roll of cling film. Soon our two heroes were tied to their chairs by the transparent plastic. Razor Bill and the asthmatic assassin were pretty pleased with their handiwork. From inside the water tank, a large luminous cloud-like bulk appeared, with pulses of purple and indigo fluctuating within the nebulous creature. Welcome, boomed a loud, ominous voice. Detective Snow Leopard, Kung Fu Penguin. You are making life needlessly difficult for us. Just doing our job, replied the detective with a smile. What determined investigators you both have proved to be. I'm sure you deserve much more reward than the salary of a humble city cop and the uncertainty of where your next paycheck is coming from of a freelancing private investigator. Imagine belonging to a network which could provide you with a more than generous, always reliable, financially secured existence. We can offer you that, if you wish to join. Like a kind of criminal franchise, asked the private eye in disbelief. Exactly. So that only really leaves one question. And what question is that? Well, let me try to explain a few things before we get to that. 
And this is where we segue into the, the songs that seem to accompany every installment, so bear with me. I used to spend my days do 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 trying to make crime pay do 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 well I kind of lost my way do 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 I became reflective it didn't take no detective to see that plan was defective so I instigated a criminal collective do 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 a criminal collective, ooh do do ooh do. A criminal collective, do 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 do. A criminal collective. So now we got a plan, but I'm not the biggest fan of the middleman. The operation's got a hole, size and shape of a vole. I want 'em six foot under, like a no good mole. Carry out the orders of the criminal collective. Ooh, do, 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 do. The criminal collective. Do, 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 do. A criminal collective. Do, 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 do. A criminal collective. Do, 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 do. Cartels who sell pills. Cure for the lurgy. Force up the cost of water and energy. Buy your own lawyer, politician, and clergy. To succeed in your objective depends on your perspective. If you're chief executive of an institutionalized criminal collective, do 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 do, criminal collective, do 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 do, a criminal collective, do do do, a criminal collective. Well, that is uh, that is interesting. Began the cup. <laughs> A secret criminal network operating under the radar of every corner of society. So what's your question? Asked Kung Fu Penguin suspiciously. Question is, are you against us or do you want to join us? What will our heroes do? Can they uphold their integrity? Or will they side with the criminal collective? Find out next time on Kung Fu Penguin! Thank you very much. You're very patient and very kind. So, thank you. Where are we at? Janetto! Hello, follow that. <laughs> I was just thinking that how, how, or, oh, or, oh, or, oh. can I follow that? <laughs> right. Um, there's a little poem that I've chuffed a bit. It's been published in The Six Resses Echoing the Heart Cave. Um, and it's called the art of not thinking. Just breathing, a flushing out of ego, a flowing in of time, to the whispering of a pencil, a pendulum on parchment, portrait of Buddha. And that's that one. Thank you. And then I have got another one following on with the John Keats theme. And I've um, pinched some of the wonderful words of John Keats for this one. And it's called A Legacy of Beauty. When I have fears that I may cease to be, I look upon the high pile books unread. I look upon the high pile, pile books unwritten. And when I behold upon the night starred face, I hope for the smile of morning and space, just space for Grecian urns and nightingales and autumn, their beauty truth, your beauty truth, and a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And that's that one. Thank you. Then, can I indulge you in a haiku? <laughs> um, this one, it was, uh, it kind of came into my mind, you know, we had the minute silence for the anniversary of the since the lockdown and I was thinking about the poems that you'd written Jules you know about when this is all over um so it's inspired by that when this is over I remember this moment silence then birdsong and that's me
Thank you, Jeanette. Those really lovely, really lovely. Thank you. And that last one, oh yeah, sums up so much in in such a short phrase. You know, it's great, really great. Thank you. Cool. All right, Chris, what All have you right. got for us? I've got a couple. Cool. Um, I suppose my original use of poem poetry was kind of when I felt a kind of need to write about something. And I was kind of interested in how you can write a poem to which you are the only witness to your own words. So these were kind of written with the idea of not having a witness other than myself and then sharing them here. So interesting to see what happens. So the kind of the I've got two and I've got a quote at the beginning of the first one which kind of frames what they're about really. And the first one's called Over the Garden Fence. And it starts with a quote. Something is a work of art when it has filled its role as therapy for the artist. I don't care about the audience. I'm not working for the audience. The, the audience is welcome to take what they can. That's a quote from a, a, a visual artist called Louise Bourgeois. Um, and this is about an experience which uh, took place recently. Over the garden fence, the sound of a chainsaw. Two Saturdays now. A neighbour occasionally cuts firewood just beyond his, his garden gate, just bits for his wood-burning stove. But this seemed to come from a different place. I ventured out one day into the scrub, a, and a small tree had been felled. Approaching it, I expected to see a small pile of logs, some local man fancying himself a pioneer. But the tree was cut just once and lay, tipped on its side, reaching out like a shipwrecked victim, one too many for the overladen lifeboat, knowing its end had come. We chose the bedroom that overlooked this land, not the bigger room by the, with the bay window, but the one that let us sit in bed and see nothing but trees and grass and birds. Occasionally at night, we would hear a fox call. Once, one summer, a brood of tawny owls set up each night and learned to sing. Over the years, the place darkened, alders spread from the wetland next to the scrub and made cover. They liked their feet in water, so they walked up the bank and made a new settlement in sight of our bed. A dog walking path went through this new wood out into the cow field where a small squeezed gate led to a stile by a scrapyard. Then a new fence removed the stile and even the dog walking path faded away. It became a feral space. My neighbour talked about riding her, her bike there as a child on rough ground dumped debris from a new estate with a stream. Then the council filled the stream after a flood and built the cricket pitch and flattened the bike tracks. And now a man felling trees. And then, in a weekend, all the trees were gone. I was bereft. On Saturday afternoon, I walked out. A cheery chap met me, apologetic. He explained in PR patter that he was building community allotment for the cricket club who managed to land it was just scrub, it needed tidying up. The parish council had agreed. Men were there with chainsaws, men on micro diggers, men on micro dumpers, boys with toys doing what boys do, pissing and power tooling and marking their territory, making noise. As the trees went down, the fence went up. Enclosure. As I voiced disquiet, he voiced surprise. The cheery man did not say I should shut up, but he had, he said, as agent of the council and an actor of the deed and captain of the club, the right to exclude. Access was permitted, he said, not a right. The local people would benefit, he said. I agreed. I was the only one to object, he said. I agreed. I would hold him forever responsible, I said, for killing the trees. He disagreed. We disagreed. We agreed to disagree. Me in anger, him, he in anger, me in grief. The act of enclosure is now a site for art. It is my gallery, it is my therapy. Walking the bounds, my enclosure encloses theirs. 
holes dug fill with water and are photographed. Sacred geometry drawn with GPS will go online. I will leave nothing but footprints. I will take nothing but photographs. Where there once were alders, the bloodwood trees that bled, there is now an arts venue, a happening, a performance. There is walking art, there is poetry, there is street art, there is an audience, but they don't know it. They are welcome to take what they can. Oh, and there is a myth that cutting older brings a fairy's curse. Only time will tell if this is true for that. I am the audience and I will take what I can. And this is um, another one which I've done quite recently. And this is, as his name says, and this is an unfinished work. A year in and it starts dissolving. The fabric of my life held in place by work and fading out of social space to fill up my home life with an entirety of existence starts flickering, wearing thin and patchy. My style, my lifestyle becomes eventually so threadbare that I would, it, would be un, it would be indecent to wear it in public. Letters on the page wear thin, etiolated and shriveled like bean sprouts drying out on desiccated blotting paper. Words on a page fade into symbols and signifiers in a museum cabinet. The object of exegesis, the subject lost line by line as my eyes track downwards. Reporting and recounting the numbers dead, the great success, the conflicts, the coming together, read like brown new sheets lining an old drawer with events now forgotten. In dark times, darkness opens her eyes to see the cracks in society and a light at the end of a tunnel now becomes the closing shot fading to white. Contrast dissolves and melts into entropy and indifference. In the workplace why I, where I worked throughout with little to do but watch unspent money fill my bank account, my boss, once a supporter of personal over professional, informs us all our contracts are now flexible and we to, need to work Saturdays. In the end, if there is an end, this new normal is the same as the old normal. What were we expecting? That's it, thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was both of those really, really terrific stuff. Thank you. Yeah, the new normal, like the old normal. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Juliet, you're next. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm just trying to open this folder. I'm trying to do right. Okay. Um. I've been. I've got a pile of big pile of rejected poems here um, on my desk, and um, I feel quite a lot of affection for these poems that are um, never going to go anywhere. You know what I mean? And I perhaps I started writing them when, uh, quite a while ago. So um, this is a bit of a love letter, really, to those poems. The bad poem. Out on the stairwell, the bad poem exhales apple magic from an e-cigarette and sends pale vapour to the sky. The stairwell, lodged between air conditioning units and the supporting wall of the town's gym, allows a puzzle piece of blue sky to be seen. The bad poem shuffles its feet and mutters under its breath about the smug tossers inside and wonders if it has always been a bad poem. It asks itself fundamental questions about whether it is inherently bad or has become bad due to the evolutionary forces of external circumstances. At this stage, the poem decides it can't know, and rather than wait to be allowed back, it slips quietly down the stairwell and out onto the street. A bad poem always knows what it wants. 
nipping into the corner shop, it gets a bag of chipsticks and a lion bar and heads over to cliched poems place. Together, bad poem and cliched poem spend the afternoon having reckless and ill-considered sex. This sex, though gratifying, will have consequences and some of these will lead to a breakdown in the stability of their current living arrangements. But so be it. A bag of chipsticks and an exclusory situation are powder kegs to a bad poem. The phone vibrates. It's dodgy poem, texting to say the stuff's arrived and to expect the dodge meister shortly. As soon as dodgy passes round the plastic bag, the books are opened. They spend the afternoon gorging on a children's book of Tennyson, Le Changé, Ginsberg and Joan Baez. Eventually, the electric goes off. And plunged into darkness, the bad poems sit digesting themselves and all they have read. Bad poem and cliched poem doze off, resting on each other's shoulders. They dream of the great oration. They will write in rhyming couplets that will blow the minds of those inside when they finally gain access to the building. I've got um, one that's a response poem to the workshop we did on Keats. Um, it was, I, I couldn't write anything about Keats, but I could write about this joke about this crocodile that was going to appear from behind the curtains. And I, uh, I really love the octopus poem that they read. So anyway, I had to go a response poem to John, to the crocodile. Craig the Crocodile. Stuck inside a tired old fess, Craig the Crocodile has passed his best. Behind the curtains in a chair, he passes each day hour by hour. To be housebound is such a shame. Then Mel and John Hegley sketched him a Zimmer frame. Up and hungry, he was out of the door. All he wanted was croc monsieur. En route to the local patisserie, he lickety-lipped his rows of teeth. The madame within was nonchalant, serving OAPs, baguettes for lunch. Used to crutches, used to limps, his zimmer didn't even catch her glimpse. Not until Craig had ordered seven of a croc monsieurie bready heaven did she raise a flowered eyebrow and wide-eyed watch Craig devour them all. One by one, each crock he threw, then with a snap, but not a single chew, catch and swallowed in his jaws the bread, the ham and bechamel sauce. Satisfied, having finished the pile, he gave Madame a warm croco smile. Then off he went to walk a mile to keep his sleek crock profile. That's it. <laughs> That was brilliant. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. Uh, yeah, we'll have to let John Hagley know. I, we maybe see this. Or, yeah, that was great. Thank you very much, Peter. What have you got for us? All right. Well, uh, I've got one about going shopping in the lockdown. And another one, and the, the and the this first one is on the open brackets London close brackets road again. We enter shop singly this year. Come the green light, she goes mass mass to patrol. Well, come the green light, she goes mass to patrol the aisles. While the dog, who has insisted on coming with us, even if only to sit here, pivots round three times, then curls up on the back seat. Supermarket on Thursday, town shopping on Tuesday. We acquire new rituals like a GPS, new map pins by which to navigate the weeks, 
the vertices jointing the edges between ledge B lays on a blank eventless wall. I park in my space by the entrance sign to look down the sites of the housing estate road to the first hill south with its crew cut of firs down, flank, down one flank, Barrack Fell, the last upthrust between Petrel and Eden. In front of the bonnet, the scarves and head down, weary down road salt grade, weary down road salt grade pavements. In a chatter of sparrows, the oversheared bushes flash with red. A blackbird swallowing berries whole disappears, then comes back for more. This this, this, of course, we, we, you'll probably recognise the London Road Aldi. Other supermarkets are available. And uh, I've, I've got another one here, which uh, comes out of the, um, the coal snap at the, at the start of last month. Um, now, I make a few predictions on here. Um, if I'm wrong about it, you'll have to uh, send me a letter care of the cemetery. Uh, it's Rickaby Park 2071. It was a time when they started to name storms, when those living nearby shifted their things upstairs with weather eyes fixed on the river gauge reports when they hit. That new year too came and the park flooded as it often did to leave when it fell, every dip and swale, each incipient gully and undulation filled, the first claimed by the water, the last it let go. The golf course, a chain of gold studded lagoons till a frost came as they drained through the grass. The first to bite for some time, toddlers gazed on a fifth element not seen in their three years, in pink and purple wellies stomping on the edge, and if not breaking through to water and wet feet, laughing at the cracking of their impact. Some flung slabs like Greek dinner plates to smash and send skidding on the surface in the chatter of long shadowed afternoons while in the quiet under trees it creaked and cracked in the smack of droplets thawing from the branches. With ice back, some said all was back to normal, we'd have winters again as before, but our grandkids have still never seen them. And at high tide we cross the Eden Bridge, walk up the channel at the salt marsh edge where the hedge and the school playing fields were. From the top of the flood bank, now the sea wall, see cross fell at the end of the long Pennine edge with its scarf that once wore a scarf of snow like great Saladin, aloof and alone. Yeah, thanks Peter. Yeah, that's uh, something to think about there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mangled the first one slightly, actually, but uh, uh, I'll read it better next time. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, so, thank you very much. It's, uh, good to see you again as well. It's been a little while, but uh, cool. Uh, uh, it's supposed to be Kevin next, but I think he may have disappeared. So, uh, we might carry on to Ross. Is that okay? And if Kevin turns up, we can we can find him uh, a slot again. But uh, he may have his internet may have conked out. Okay, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I wasn't actually going to read this uh, poem, but George kind of mentioned his his dogs before, and it kind of made me made me think about this one. So I pulled it out of the pile. It was my mum's birthday uh, yesterday, and this is a poem about her late boxer um, Zoe. So I thought it was sort of appropriate as well. It's called um, Daft Doug, or the former heavyweight champion of the world. And it goes like this. Old legs, haggard Kirk steeples, the undisputed champ size, benign warts, size of meatballs, cataracts our eyes, heavy of Jacobean jowl, gray of furrowed napper, chocolate snowball coating with sugar flang in splatters, flapped out on a hairy throne, Switching like bonfire night, her overactive dreamscape, that rising smell of shite, a jolt that up her cutting paw, a flap, a swipper, dodging ear. She's clattering old Ali, 
in a Rami in Zaire. She's no well. She's never well. 110 years old. Doug gears the experience once more to brave the cold. Their last bill was 40 quid and 47 pence. Still she ain't. Scares her ain't still self stiff with her on flatulence. Out of the vets, stuff to do. No time for long goodbyes. Cheers, Jerry. I'll catch you soon. No too soon, he replies. And that's it. Uh, yeah, I've I've got one more as well. This is um sort of variation on one of the Keats, one of the ones that came out of the John Hegley uh, workshop type thing, um, and it's called Keats doesn't rhyme with Yeats. It's an I rhyme, you rhyme, he she we rhyme, sunshine, they rhyme and dubiously entwine all the time. It looks as though it should, but all being well and good, you know the name Keats doesn't rhyme with Yeats. Life is admittedly sometimes tough. Both rhymes with cluff, nearly, but only when it's Frank from TV, you see. A big beer stein is not a Brian Steen, and Sean, most certainly, doesn't coalesce with Bean. No matter how I shoehorn it, denounce or mispronounce it, brutally contort it, I'll always find that Keats doesn't rhyme with Yeats. But so what? Why bother? What's the point, eh? In a romantic poet for the era of the meh. For big time sensuality, a distinct lack of triviality, sometimes maybe we need to be reminded that beauty is actually there. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. That's a good one. That's, I like that. I like that last one. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it okay for Josephine to go next, uh, and then uh, then George? Yeah. Uh, oh, I keep losing my place. Here we are. Um, I'll read the poem which um, I wrote after my mother died, um, alone in her living room. Um, the day after I sent her death relay service. Um, anyway, did you lean forward, half expecting a visitor, or poised like an archer, aligning an arrow with its target? Three more in your quiver to go. At the moment, your visitor, as if for lack of what to say, when you saw the card on the mat, the last card, and did you gasp when your visitor arrived and show him the snail shells? scattered on the garden path where you'd sat in the, did you slowly drift to sleep, your cat beside you, your stick propped on the two-seater, the TV listings creased open on your left, or were you startled by lights from Matteo V. Giovanni's assumption for the first time since it was copied in the National Gallery by student Dorothy Morgan and slowly browned over the years? What was the moment like? Was it like slipping out the back door? at night, lifting and dropping the latch as silently as you could manage, as the Christmas cards in the unopened package turned into a flock of birds and departed in all directions. 
questions. Thank you, Josephine. That was that was that was very powerful. Uh, do you have another one? Um, yes, uh, this is my um, kicked poem. Cool. Um, it's written um, based on one of his letters from the voice of John Keats. It's called Clean. You complain my kisses lacerate your chin. So I'll need some hot and cold. No brush. I'll just splash water, lather foam on cheeks and under jawbone, slide it over. Not very systematical, just anywhere. Reynolds now, he's really getting a fat face. Can I be your skin, a skin that's pure, from top of cheekbone down to the chin, up the other side? A man can be quite bold with his own face, if not a woman's. If, as often, I nick it, a rag will suck the blood. I've been out too much lately. Ah. They talked of Smith and his snotty chums. But would I have been with Smith, not them? nothings tend to hide. I squint at them, can't see, must feel for them. Like the rib that once apparently was pilfered from my side. I stretch the skin, hobble down, a rabbit hunt. Would you have me shaved till all my skin is gone? Is my lover to be my assassin, or I yours? I dip the blade, flick droplets clear, get down to the root of all its crescences. Thanks, Josephine. Those were two really nice pieces. Thank you very much for sharing those. Okay, and uh, uh, George, what you got for us? Thanks, Phil. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of things tonight have been about water, uh, among other things, but well, quite a lot about water. But I thought I'd take his bike to, well, take me back to something I wrote a wee while back, which was the, the year that I wrote down at the loch side, the local loch. And particularly, I thought I'd start at Good Friday and just do a couple of them, mate. Good Friday. No waterfowl brave the storm. Tonight, there is only the smack of waves, water spraying over the path, the boatyard banshee call tortured in the rigging. A bunch of daffodils in full bloom, sheltered by a screen of grasses, dance a lively jig, nod heads and welcome to Spring's Resurrection. And a <laughs> wake up call. The lock lies calm, stretches lazily as rising day powders pink the high cloud. Rooks scavenge the last morsels from an Indian takeaway. Two ducks fly east where embers become burning gold. First burst of sunlight ripples across the water. Twelve coots die for breakfast. A gay, gray goose cries, wake up, wake up. And if I can just finish with a quick one, Phil, uh, which hopefully might end my little bit with a laugh. Uh, I loved going down to the locks. I actually used to, the RSPC, they always tell you don't feed the duck, you know, don't feed bread. And I think that most of the ones down in our local lock, if they didn't get their regular dash of Warburton's, would all die. And because they certainly seem pretty well addicted to it. Anyway, disappointment. 
A grandmother parks, brings a granddaughter holding bag of bread. I am surprised at grandmother's surprise. The swans do not form a polite queue, wait to be served. The army that marches from the loch ignores her cries of keep back, defence with a handful of roll merely aggravates. Quick retreat from this phalanx, they throw the bread away as they run, heads down to avoid the diving gulls. This attempt at rapprochement has not gone well. Thank you. Thank you, George. Those are great. Cool. All right. I've got one more here, uh, just to, to, to round things off. This one's poetry. You've probably heard it before. It goes like this. Poetry is not truth. Poetry is creation. Poetry is imagination. Poetry is supposition. Poetry is fiction. Poetry is not real. Poetry is surreal. Poetry is dream weaving. Poetry is asking questions. Poetry is making sense of the world. Poetry is making a nonsense of the world. Poetry is words. Poetry is trying to be clever. Poetry is not as clever as it thinks. Poetry is immediate. Poetry is raw. Poetry is anything. Poetry is not everything. Poetry is poetry. There you are. Thank you very much. Now, Becca probably remembers that one because she was there for moral support for, uh, was it National Poetry Day a couple of years ago? And we got, I got a panicky phone call from Border TV. Uh, and they said, it's National Poetry Day. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's National Poetry Day every year. Uh, and they went, you're a poet. <laughs> Can you do something? And we ended up going to um, to do a little piece uh, at uh, board, uh, book bookends, wasn't it? In the secret room. In the secret room with all the uh, where they keep the expensive books. That was cool. Expensive books, and they said, "Have you got a, a poem? You need to do it as as live, so you only get one go. And oh. we're going to film you, and we're going to go back to the studio uh, at some point. So um, pick a poem and uh, and read it, but." Um, We'll, we, we'll, we don't know when we're going to go back. I was like, well, I've got this one. It's called Poetry. It's Poetry Day. Seems appropriate. Let's see how we get on. And I'm doing the poem. And I can see the reporter and the cameraman exchanging sort of slightly worried glances and stuff. And they're obviously <laughs> hearing from the uh, backroom people uh, in the studio wherever saying, Count down, counting down the time to when they've got to go over to the news presenters. And I just reached the end of the poem and they all were like thumbs up and everything. And um, I said, what was that all about? And they said, oh, we were worried you, uh, you weren't going to finish your poem and we were going to go back to the news presenters before you finished. And then you just finished dead on time. And then they went back to the thing. And I was like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> it was nothing really. <laughs> Professional. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but there you go. It's been a great night. Thank you everybody for joining in. Let's give everyone a round of applause, everyone who read. Everybody who listened, maybe everyone who sang, I don't know. Uh, uh, everybody who left before the end and stayed mm. very bitter in. And uh, a big thank you to all the essential workers who are keeping us safe and, and they're doing a great job. I was going to say thank you, Phil, for organizing the Zoom meeting, but that sounds like weird after the essential work. Thank you, Phil! <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you all for coming along and uh, um, yeah, let's do it again uh, next month. And there'll be Poets Out Loud on um, 14th of Mar uh, April, April already. How's that come along? Phew. You need to make a cake next month though, Phil. If you remember, you ought to have done a year <laughs> anniversary in lockdown. So we're all expecting yep. cake we, next we month. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, expecting yeah. a slice laid on every doorstep. Um, <laughs> so make sure you get everyone's dresses. Yeah. We could all make, bring little fairy cake. Time. Penguin fairy cakes. Oh. Hey. Oh. Party hats. Penguin cakes.
Merge. Don't forget, don't trust anything you hear tomorrow morning. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Happy April Fool's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Get home safe. And <laughs> we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. It's been wonderful. Bye, nice. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care. See you guys. Bye.